I want to thank Ellen for uh, inviting me to talk today. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the top five things that you don't want to miss in pediatric orthopedics. So I'm going to end up going through. What happened now? Okay. Uh, okay, so let's advance now. So I'm going to give a couple scenarios for each of these. So the first scenario, we have a three-year-old right-hand dominant girl who's being swung around by her cousin and suddenly became uh, uh, in pain screaming. Uh, she was found with her left arm held at her side, grabbing her left wrist. She had no swelling or areas of tenderness upon palpation, but she refused to move her elbow. So we have a couple of differentials. We have a sprain, contusion, fracture, nurse maid's elbow, and shoulder dislocation. So for those of you who said nursemaid elbow, you would be correct. So <clears throat> this is typically called, referred to as a pulled elbow or a dislocated elbow. Uh, very often the typical uh, presentation, they'll talk about the child being lifted by one arm or being swung around by one hand uh, and then sudden pain. You'll typically see it under the age of four, although I've seen it as late as five. Now, the, what happens with the nursemaid's elbow is you have the annular ligament, which helps to hold the radial head in place. And in, in the young ones, it's very loose. So if the arm is pulled down, the radius gets pulled down, and the annular ligament can actually slip into the joint, which becomes very painful. Uh, so it ends up giving you subluxation of the radial head, and since any movement of the elbow or the forearm becomes painful, they're not willing to do it. Now, there's a couple of things that help to differentiate whether this is a nursemaid's elbow or a fracture. And the radial neck fracture is really the big one that can be difficult to distinguish. Um, with the nursemaid's elbow, typically you're not going to get any swelling, though you can see that with the fractures. Um, you're not going to see any deformity, although honestly with the radial neck fractures you won't either. Uh, you typically won't get any ecchymosis. Uh, the biggest difference I find is that the fracture is usually going to be tender right over that radial neck whereas the nursemaids don't typically have any uh, tenderness. So they may have pain with range of motion, but no tenderness. The other thing is I find that very often the radial necks will tend to have the elbows flexed uh, in neutral, basically holding it towards their belly, whereas with the nursemaids, they tend to keep the arm fully, uh, the elbow fully extended at their side with the forearm pronated. Um, <clears throat> now, if there's any unusual history, we generally recommend getting an elbow to make sure that there is no fracture. Uh, very often, unfortunately, with the radial neck fractures, they may look normal also. However, sometimes you'll see what's called a posterior fat pad sign, which is where you see, and this is not all that obvious, but you can see this little uh, black area over here, which indicates that there's some sort of effusion or swelling inside of the joint. That you won't see with the nursemaid's elbow. So <clears throat> for what you can do as a pediatrician or urgent care doctor, um, if there's a blatantly obvious history. The, uh, the parents specifically say, I lifted him up and he suddenly started screaming. If you want to just go straight towards reduction, you can. If there's any question on the exam or on the history, we generally recommend that you end up getting an x-ray first. <clears throat> if everything is consistent with a nursemaid's elbow, you can end up attempting a reduction a couple of times. If any time beyond two, three times at most, if you haven't gotten it, the best bet is to splint them and have them sent into an orthopedist. Now, I actually was asked this question out in the uh, area before. Um, there are a couple of different ways that I've heard described to reduce the nursemaid elbow. What they want to do is keep their elbow extended and pronated. So usually the way that I'll do it is we'll end up supinating the forearm and then flexing up, almost making it like they're trying to grab their shoulder. And usually as it pops back into place, you'll hear a click over there. The kids don't like it, but after usually a couple minutes, they stop crying. And then usually within 10 to 15 minutes, they're back to using the arm and playing with no sequelae. So scenario number two, we have a 13-year-old male who complains of a two-month history of progressively worsening right thigh or knee pain and limp, which is worse with activities. There's no history of trauma, there's no history of fever. Now take, remember the age over here when you're trying to figure this one out. So we have a quad strain, Perthes disease, fracture, skiffy, or hip dysplasia. Now, if you're talking about a 13-year-old, you're really looking at a skiffy. Now, what a skiffy is, is the proximal femoral capital epiphysis, or the head of the femur, shifts posteriorly uh, through that growth plate over there and ends up causing a deformity like this. Now, the 
textbook description is a 13-year-old obese African-American male. Um, <clears throat> it typically is going to be on one side, although there is definitely a small percentage that can be bilateral. Uh, one of the big things, they usually occur between the ages of 10 and 15. If you have a patient that's less than 10 or over the age of 15, uh, you have to think about possible endocrine uh, disorders, either uh, abnormal thyroid profile or growth hormone profile. So if I have a patient that's out of that normal range, I'll usually send them over to one of the endocrinologists to make sure that there is nothing else that we have to be concerned about. Now, there are a couple of different classifications that we use for the slips. Uh, we use based on time. So you have acute, which are ones that occur within three weeks uh, or have been going on for about three weeks, and this is a typical occurrence where it literally looks like a fracture where the head is just shifted. You have chronic, which is where they're greater than three weeks. Uh, so a lot of times they'll present with six months of hip pain and limp, something like that. And usually on the x-ray, you're gonna see that this has actually started to remodel, and you get this gentle bump over here. Uh, and then you have your acute on chronic, which is somebody that's been presenting uh, with six months of hip pain, and all of a sudden yesterday they had a sudden jump in the pain. The second classification we use are stable versus unstable, and that's based off of how much weight they can bear. So if they're able to wait, uh, walk, they're stable. If they're not willing to put any weight down on it and bear weight, those are the ones that are unstable. Uh, and that plays a role in uh, the type of treatment, how quickly you have to treat them. Now, patients will usually come in complaining about uh, groin or knee pain. Uh, they'll very often have that Trendelenburg gait that uh, uh, Dr. Davis was talking about before because of muscle weakness around the hip. They also, because of the deformity that occurs with this, will tend to turn their toes out. So it's not just purely that lurch that they get, but you'll see that that one foot externally rotates more than the other. On exam, very often they're gonna have a uh, limitation on how much they're willing to abduct the hip, as well as how much they're willing to internally rotate the hip. Uh, and then one of the classic signs is this obligatory external rotation. So when you try to flex the hip up, it won't come straight up. It comes up and then suddenly rotates out because that deformity is basically pushing them in that direction. For evaluation, typically what we're gonna end up looking at are honestly our x-rays. We don't usually, with rare exception, have to do anything beyond that. Uh, and you wanna do your AP view, and honestly, of the two, the frog leg lateral view is the uh, better, just because it is slipping posteriorly. So having the two to compare, and I always get pelvis. I never get hip x-rays for this, because you wanna be able to actually tell the difference between the two of them. So if you now turn those two hips uh, so that they're straight up and down, this is how I usually describe it to the parents. You want to think of this as an ice cream cone, where the femoral neck is the cone and the ball of the hip is the ice cream scoop. So in the normal hip, it stays right on top of the cone, whereas in the abnormal hip, you see it start to slide further and further back until you get this. Hopefully you don't ever get to that. <clears throat> You can assess them on the AP uh, where you have what's called a Klein's line, which is where you draw a line up the superior aspect of the neck. In a normal one, it should actually intersect with part of the uh, femoral head. When the head's already started to slip though, it may not actually intersect with that, which shows that there is something abnormal going on. Now, treatment for the slips is almost always gonna be something surgical. Uh, and either it's basically to prevent them from slipping further or once it's actually slipped and been stabilized to remove that bump over there that ends up impinging against the socket. Or the third option is actually an acute correction of the slip where you basically go in and put it back. Now, the gold standard for treatment during an acute slip is gonna be in situ pinning, meaning that you put a screw across that in the positions that it's in. You don't wanna end up pushing on it uh, and trying to reduce it. And the main reason is that the main blood supply to the femoral head is in the back. Uh, and if you try to push this forward, you can end up putting tension on that blood supply and cutting off the blood supply to the femoral head and actually causing uh, avascular necrosis. So you're actually doing them harm by doing that. Uh, when we do this, we usually wanna put the screw uh, anteriorly in the neck and then shoot to aim into the center of the head. And the advantage of that is one, you avoid coming out the back and possibly damaging the blood supply, but two, you also make it much less likely that you're gonna come through the head into the socket and cause further damage. Now, <clears throat> when you end up having a slip, you end up getting this deformity over here. Uh, and over time, it will end up developing this kind of soft curve over here. Now, the problem with this, when it's left this way, is that as the hip goes to flex up, say, to get into a seated position, that bump will beat up against the uh, socket and the labrum and can lead to arthritis. So there are two ways that we can actually try to decrease that impingement. One is to go in and basically shave down that bump so that when you are flexing, it's not banging up against there, uh, 
Uh, and that can either be done open or arthroscopically where you basically go down and shave that down. Or you can end up doing an osteotomy where you end up cutting the bone and actually flexing that forward so that way when they do end up flexing uh, the hip up, it, that bump has been taken out of the way. The third way uh, is something that kind of caught fire about maybe 10 years ago where when they come in with an acute slip, it's almost like having a fracture. You end up going and you do a surgical dislocation of the femoral head, and what you do is you remove uh, any of the uh, bone that actually would put tension on the, uh, the blood supply, and you put the ball back into the socket. And it sounds great, and it ends up making this look fantastic. It's a little hard to see, but that looks basically like a perfectly normal hip. Uh, the problem is that they actually, as they've done more studies, they've realized that there is actually more of a risk of AVN than they really noted before. So these don't happen all that often, but they look much cooler and sexier than the other ones. And I just, I found this after the fact, but I just kind of figured I had to put it in because this just summarized everything I said in a matter of uh, one picture. So scenario number three, we have a seven-year-old male who complains of a two-month history of progressively worsening right groin pain and limp. No history of trauma, no history of fever. So similar, uh, similar story to what we talked about before, but on this one, again, take note of the age. So we have a septic arthritis, Perthes disease, a fracture, skiffy, or hip dysplasia. And in this one, we're talking about Perthes disease. Now, Perthes disease is an avascular necrosis of the femoral head that basically runs a course and then actually ends, as opposed to in an adult where it happens and then the hip is just destroyed. Uh, it's the most likely cause of hip stiffness and limp in patients between the ages of four and eight, and that's because that's the age that it actually happens. It's more common in boys than in girls. It can happen bilaterally, although of note, if they happen, if it's gonna be bilateral, usually it happens in one and then later happens in the other. If they happen at the same time, uh, that's very unusual. And with those, we have to think about some uh, form of epiphyseal dysplasia uh, that's occurring. And it is more common in Caucasians than African Americans as opposed to the skiffy. Uh, now, the exact cause of the AVM, we really don't have a good sense. The typical patient you're gonna see is gonna be a small, thin, hyperactive boy. They'll usually complain about groin, hip, thigh, or knee pain. It's very often activity related. <clears throat> The, they're able to ambulate, which is definitely a difference between that and the skiffies. <coughs> uh, and commonly, they'll present with a limp uh, with the Trendelenburg gait. You don't see the external rotation like you do with the skiffy, but on exam, you also get that loss of internal rotation and abduction. Now, the standard of choice for imaging is gonna be your AP and frog leg views of the pelvis, once again, so that way you can see what the normal looks like and what the abnormal looks like. Um, and usually we actually use the AP view on this one more than we do the lateral view, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second just because uh, <clears throat> it, it plays into the role as far as the classifications. Now with this, this is something that's running its course. So we generally want to see how it's progressing, and we usually end up having to bring them in every three to four months for repeat x-rays to see what direction this is going. Now there are four phases to the Perthes. It starts out where they just start getting a little effusion and it starts to get sclerotic. And then it starts to actually break down because of the avascular necrosis. And then the third is basically where it starts to reossify. And then the fourth is basically what you're left with when all is said and done. For the classifications, we have some classifications that talk about what's going on during the disease process and then classifications in that fourth stage when you're basically left with something. And again, these each play roles in what's gonna happen and what we need to do down the road. So Herring's classification is, your, is the, the main one that's used. And what it's looking at is the amount of collapse that you get in this lateral pillar, the lateral portion of the head. So if there's really nothing that's going on in that lateral portal, and it's really more, uh, sorry, column, and it's more down over here, that's your type A. Uh, when it's collapsed, but it's still more than 50% that's present, that's your B, and then when it's really severe, where it's gone below that 50%, that's a C and that's going from good all the way down to bad. The, uh, <clears throat> now with the, when you have this reossification, uh, very often there is some damage and deformity that's occurred. So very often you may see that the head is larger or flatter, you have a shorter neck, there may be some level of incongruency between the femoral head and neck, and that's where the second classification comes in. So you have your Stuhlberg classification, which basically looks at the roundness of the femoral head and then how well it matches up with the socket. And obviously the rounder the head is the, and the more congruent it is, the better 
And then as you get down over to this weird looking hip, the chance of developing arthritis is much greater. And Mohs is basically just looking at how round the hip is. So it, <clears throat> the, uh, that first herring classification has a guide as to what we do when we're treating them during the process. These two are really about what we're likely looking at 30, 40, 50 years down the road and what their risks of developing arthritis are. So we have a couple of prognostic factors. During the disease process, we're using that herring classification. So it's a matter of whether it's an A, B, or C on that uh, evaluation. Their age, if they're younger, they tend to do better than if they're present for the first time when they're older. Males also tend to do better than females. And then after the fact, with that residual phase, we have those two classifications we talked about. Now, <clears throat> the herring classification is very useful for determining how we need to treat this. Um, Patients who are in the group A, no matter what age they are, tend to do very well. So very often, there isn't a whole lot that we need to do other than try to keep them symptomatic and just try and get their hips continuing to move. The type Cs, unfortunately, even when they occur young, very often tend to do poorly. And studies have shown that they really don't do much better when you operate on them. So it's generally not recommended to operate on those type As or Cs uh, because it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. The place where this really is important is in these type, these group Bs. Uh, patients under the age of eight, again, generally tend to do fairly well and more often than not don't need anything surgical. It's these type Bs or group Bs that really are older where surgery can actually play a big role in how they do. Now, during the course of the treatment, the main thing you want to do is try and keep the head inside the socket and maintain the range of motion. And by maintaining the range of motion, I'll usually describe to the patients that you think of the femoral head as a ball of Play-Doh. If you're constantly putting pressure on all different sides, you can keep that ball round. If you're just putting pressure on one side, you're gonna end up getting a flat deformed ball over there. So you wanna try and maintain that range of motion. The second phase, again, is that what you're left with, and that's basically how you're gonna go and rescue the patient once that hip is deformed to try and prevent them from having arthritis down the road. So, um, Again, during the, uh, the non-operative management, you want to keep them comfortable, keep that range of motion going. In patients in that uh, group B that are older, uh, where you want to contain that femoral head and you're not doing it via uh, non-operative management, usually you're going to want to try and uh, cover that ball. You can do that from one of uh, two ways, either on the femoral side where you do an osteotomy and basically bend the neck down so that you basically push the ball back into the socket, or on the other side of it, you can end up doing an osteotomy on the acetabulum, and this is just one of them, where you end up sliding it so that you actually provide coverage. Neither of these are optimal, but they're better than what they had before. <clears throat> now, again, in that salvage, uh, once they are all done with everything and they're left with the deformity, there are two ways that you can treat this. Either, similar to what we talked about with the skiffy, you can go in and just shave down any bump that's over there so it's not impinging, or more often I find we end up having to do an osteotomy and you're almost doing the opposite of what we just talked about. You're basically trying to get this damaged part out of the, uh, out of the socket. So you actually do a valgus osteotomy so that that damaged part is sitting as far out as possible. Scenario number four, uh, we're getting there. We have <clears throat> a 10 year old male who presents to the ED with his parents after his finger was slammed in a car door. His parents are concerned that it's bleeding at the base of the nail and appears to be deformed. Our differential includes a tuft fracture, mallet finger injury, swan neck deformity, Seymour fracture, or a finger sprain. And this one we're talking about Seymour fracture, which most people have probably never heard of. So <clears throat> you don't want to overlook the Seymour fractures. Now the most common finger that's involved is the middle finger. Uh, <clears throat> what, the reason that we get concerned about this is that when you have an injury to the nail plate, that basically leads an open trail down to the base of the finger where that fracture is. So for all intents and purposes, this is essentially an open fracture. Uh, usually it's gonna be a Salter one or Salter two fracture through the base of the distal phalanx. And with the nail bed injury, either it's just gonna be a laceration over there or the nail is actually gonna avulse so that it's sitting on top of the epinechial fold. Uh, and with these, sometimes what'll happen actually is some of the soft tissue will then get caught in that fracture and block it from reducing. Now it typically happens similar to the way the mallet fingers occur in the adults where you're avulsing the extensor tendon. It's either from a uh, direct trauma, crush injury, or hyperflexion. Uh, and the reason that you get that deformity is that if you get a fracture here, your extensor tendons are pulling on the epiphysis this way, and your flexor tendons are pulling on the metaphysis this way, basically causing that to bend down. 
And that very often will end up giving it a similar appearance to your mallet finger where it bends down like this. The difference is that usually you're gonna see uh, ecchymosis and swelling with this injury, uh, and two, you're gonna end up seeing that nail plate injury, which you don't see with the mallet fingers. X-rays are, are, are basically the test of treatment, just like pretty much everything else I've said. Uh, the, you wanna get AP and lateral. Now the AP can sometimes be deceptive because this looks irregular, but you don't see a true fracture there. When you go over to the lateral, you can see the fracture line that's over here. And either if it's a type A, you might just see some widening of the physis, or you end up seeing something like this where you see the flexion over there. Now, treatments can either be operative or non-operative. Uh, if you have a patient where it's minimally reduced or not, or really hasn't shifted at all, where you can actually put it back into place uh, and there's no soft tissue blocking it, very often you can just wash it out, treat them with antibiotics and a splint, uh, and that's it. And again, the reason you wanna treat with antibiotics is because, as I said before, this is essentially an open fracture. In patients where either there's soft tissue interposed so you can't reduce it or it's just very unstable, those are the ones that you end up taking to the operating room so that way uh, you can wash it out, put, give them antibiotics, and then actually put a pin across to stabilize it until it's had a chance to heal. Now, the reason that this is even being brought up in this conversation is that just like a lot of the other things, if these are missed, it can cause devastation to whatever joint or limb that it's uh, involved in. And if it's not recognized, the problem is either it's gonna cause a nail plate deformity or a growth plate arrest, which are really the minor ones. The big one is that it can actually lead to uh, uh, osteomyelitis. And that typically will occur either in ones that are just partially treated, either they were given antibiotics but it wasn't washed out or it was washed out and they weren't given antibiotics, or if it's delayed. So if it's not caught immediately and it goes beyond 24 hours, the risk of osteomyelitis gets much greater. And the finale. We have scenario number five. We have a 12-year-old male who sustains a crush injury to his lower leg. No fracture is seen in the ER. He's splinted and sent home. Overnight, his pain is progressively worsening in the lower leg without relief from pain meds. <clears throat> he complains of pain with range of motion of his toes. So our differential includes calf strain, contusion, compartment syndrome, patella fracture, and talus fracture. Yes, see, <clears throat> we're talking about a compartment syndrome. Now, compartment syndrome, the reason that they occur is that you get swelling in the muscles, whether it's just from a crush injury, whether it's from a fracture, and the problem is that those muscles are all contained within a fascia, almost like a sausage where the, the filling is inside of that lining. Uh, and the problem is that that fascia really doesn't allow for much expansion. So if there's enough swelling, eventually those muscles will exp expand beyond what that fascia will allow, and that ends up causing increased pressure within the compartment. And as it starts to uh, uh, get increased pressure, it starts to eventually cut off the blood supply to that compartment. Now, ischemia in a healthy muscle uh, generally will uh, start to occur once you're within 10 of diastolic. Ischemia of an injured muscle, such as in a crush injury or in a fracture, will start even lower when you're about 20 away from diastolic. Now, the muscle can, dis ah. <clears throat> the muscle can uh, stay electrically responsive for up to three hours after uh, ischemia, and it can survive up to four hours without irreversible damage. After eight hours, that damage very often is irreversible, and you have some problems. Similarly, the nerves can end up getting injury. So you can have, <clears throat> the nerve can conduct impulses for an hour after total ischemia, and it can survive for up to four hours without irreversible damages uh, or damage. By eight hours, usually that damage becomes irreversible. Now, everybody has probably heard of the five Ps. You have progressively, well, it used to be progressively, now it's progressively, progressively worsening pain out of proportion. Uh, pal you know, this is because of it switched from a Mac to, to uh, IBM. Uh, pallor, paralysis, pulselessness, and paresthesias. Uh, now, the big thing to understand, even though you were taught all of these things, it's critical to note that these signs and symptoms are of an established syndrome with ischemia that's already started, uh, taken place and at surgery at this stage, it tends to not give as good a result. Now, when we talk about pain out of proportion, unfortunately, that's a very uh, ob uh, subjective uh, definition. The, uh, all of these, I would say, are probably out of proportion. <clears throat> now, when we're examining somebody to test who may or may not have pain out of proportion, usually what we'll end up doing is doing some gentle passive range of motion of the fingers. Now, if there's a fracture right over here and you're moving the fingers gently, they may have some pain, 
but if they're jumping off of the table because it's that painful, that usually indicates that there's a little too much pressure in there and that they may be going on to uh, a compartment syndrome. Things like paralysis and sensory changes usually won't happen until at least an hour after the ischemia has uh, started taking place or is uh, developed. And loss of distal pulses, pallor, and diminution of capillary refill rarely occur unless there's either an arterial injury or the pressure is so high that it's basically reached up to systolic pressure where the arteries are not able to actually pump the blood in there. Now, as great as the five Ps are, or honestly that first P, uh, they're only useful if the patient is aware and can actually respond to you. Uh, the other thing is if it's gone so far that they actually, the nerves are not conducting to tell you that they're having pain, you may, moving, may be moving them with a compartment syndrome and they may not feel anything to complain about. In addition, it's very difficult to establish sometimes in kids who really are not great historians and may just cry about anything that you do the second you walk into the room. If you have a patient where they're cooperative but it's a very questionable exam, you can actually check the pressures in the, uh, in the compartment by basically putting, uh, this striker is the most common one, not that I'm promoting them, but that's one of the most common pressure sensors where you end up putting the needle in there and it'll actually tell you the pressure. Uh, it also can be very useful if you have a patient that is unresponsive with a swollen, tense limb. When you have somebody where you have a high suspicion, and sometimes in all honesty, even if you don't have all the criteria there, but you have a very high suspicion, a compartment syndrome is devastating to patients. So if you have any suspicion, just like they tell you if you have a suspicion of an appendicitis, you should take care of it. Uh, with a compartment syndrome, if you have a high suspicion, you wanna treat it. Unfortunately, the only way to treat it is to basically open up all the fascia for those various compartments. So the forearm and the leg are the most common. If you have a compartment syndrome of the forearm, you're gonna make a, an incision basically from stem to stern, from the elbow down to the wrist to open up the fascia around those muscles, and then on the volar side of the arm similarly. On the leg, you're gonna have to make two, uh, one medial and one lateral incision, uh, the other way around. So that way you can end up opening them up, so that way those muscles have room to breathe and aren't cutting off the circulation. That's all. So it depends on a lot of things. If they're, sorry, if it's on a mild skiffy, um, if they can't bear weight, if it's an unstable one, I'm gonna send them into the ER to try and do it as soon as possible. The, uh, if, whether it's that night or the next morning. If it's something where they come in where it's been bothering them for a week or six months, usually I'll put them on crutches, let them be toe touch weight bearing, and then I'll bring them in to the OR within the next couple of days. The, uh, so that way, we're not letting it go too far, but I'm not making them sit in an ER for seven hours until they're ready to, to go undergo anesthesia. Okay. 